Contested bones, number 19. And the final uh, section that we will deal with contested bones. Um, we've been talking about the book Contested Bones by Rup, Sanf uh, Rup and Sanford. Um, there's the cover. Um, Chris Rupe is on the left and John Sanford is on the right. To review what we've been through so far, in the prologue, John Sanford explains that he believed in evolution until about the age of 50, when he realized the importance of evolution, uh, pardon me, the impotence of evolution, and the impact of genetic entropy, which fights against any kind of evolution. And then he had cognitive dissonance with all the fossil evidence of man evolving from apes that he had been taught about. And so he and one of his protégés, Chris Rue, set about to investigate. And the rest of the book is their investigation. Chapter one discusses the advancing apes icon, the evolutionary story, scientific method in general, philosophy of science if you like, and the tra taxonomic principles that they employ. They are lumpers rather than splitters. Uh, in chapter two, in chapter two, they note that the te textbook picture following Darwin's expectations is straight line evolution. However, the field is now widely acknowledged to be more bush-like, and some evolutionists who say there should be some traceable path will say that the ascent of man cannot be traced with the material we have and may never be able to be traced. And as they note, almost all of the fossils are contested. And of course, we can ask the question, why? Chapter three argues pretty strongly and convincingly that Neanderthals are essentially human. The chapter four, that Homo erectus is human, and chapter four, five, that Homo floresiensis, or the hobbit, is human. Chapter six argues that Australopithecus afarensis is an ape, Chapter seven, Ardipithecus rhamidus is also an ape. The human-like parts are the parts that aren't there, which is curious. And even more curious is that Ardipithecus's parts that aren't there are not the same as Australopithecus's parts that aren't there. Um, meaning that in order for evolution to pass through both of them, it would have had to take a zigzag. Chapter eight, Homo habilis is not actually a creature at all. It's a mixture of two creatures, one ape and one human, or what they would call a false taxon. The same is true for Australopithecus sediba in chapter nine. And in chapter 10, they argue that Homo naledi is human. Of interest, there is a recent article that, uh, from a creationist that argues that Homo naledi is an ape, and it would be interesting to compare uh, sometime the, uh, the, the differences in how they're, how they're looking at things. In chapter 11, they note that modern humans lived alongside of apes, and in fact, that goes back to 5.7 million years old by conventional dating which means that you can't explain the arise of humans from apes in the standard way. You have to start greater than 5.7 million years ago by conventional dating. Of course, chapter 12 challenges conventional dating. They say potassium, argon, and argon dating have trouble identifying recent lava, which is, by the way, true as does uranium thorium dating, which is also true, and carbon-14 dating argues for a young age for life on Earth, which is definitely true. Even when dating methods agree, they are not secure. Chapter 13 delves into Sanford's area of expertise noting the genetic arguments against the Darwinist explanation or any other process that does not incorporate intelligence. For any transition from apes to man, 
are in fact very strong and genetic arguments for such a transition are weak and not to non-existent. And now we're in chapter 13. We're taking the second part of the chapter. The chapter is entitled a simple, did I say, we are in chapter 14. That is an error. Yeah, 13, I, I missed, sorry, I missed changing the number there. A uh, simpler model of validation of the ape to man story and the quote that they use is no doubt about it. Australopithecines are like apes and the homo group are like humans. Which is a quote from a standard paleoanthropologist from the University College in London. Now, this is my summary of what we covered the first part of chapter 14 last week. The first part of chapter 14 argued that the attempt to find an ape to man sequence has so far failed and proposed that this is because there never was an ape to man sequence in the first place. Instead, man and ape were always two or more distinct lineages. And then we're going to come to their synthesis. Um, and the, the first part is our, our alternative framework for understanding human history. They start at this section by saying, if we did not evolve from a common ape ancestor, how do we explain the origin of mankind and the extravagant diversity of primates? Evidence does not speak for itself. All evidence must be interpreted. When it comes to the field of paleoanthropology, the fossil evidence has always been interpreted in the light of, evolutionary, of the evolutionary view of human history. The ape to man story did not arise by scientific observations. It arose as a philosophically driven speculation based on Darwin's early writings. Remember when Darwin proposed all this? There were no ape men or even the supposed ape men. The ape to man story was narrated before any hominin fossil had been named. It is from within this ape to man framework that the paleo community now admits they cannot make evolutionary sense of the hominin fossils. We suggest that the reason they have this problem is because they are interpreting the fossils in light of a flawed ideological presupposition that the Darwin mechanism explains everything, even us. We wish to be open and transparent and acknowledge that we too have our own presuppositions which affect our interpretation of the hominin fossils. We are not confessing a scientific sin. In fact, all honest scientists should openly disclose their preconceptions and philosophical commitments. Such open disclosure is essential to a scientist's professional integrity. We are Bible-believing Christians and we are convinced that man was created by God in his image. We are not ashamed of this view, which is held by a large part of humanity, including a significant number of living scientists and most of the founding fathers of science. But we cannot prove our view of history scientifically, no more than evolutionists can prove the spontaneous origin of life. However, we can rigorously and scientifically demonstrate that the antithesis of a created humanity is not credible. This is the main thesis of this book. So if you want to know what the book is all about, that's it. In addition, we have previously shown that mutation selection is not capable of genetically transforming an ape population into modern humans. This is for two major reasons, which we just reviewed. The one, the immediate, inordinately long waiting time required for even a tiny string of DNA letters, specific codependent mutations, to arise and become established in a model hominin sized population. Uh, and that, by the way, that references to Sanford's own work. And two, due to the relentless accumulation of harmless, harmful mutations that result in the systematic erosion of the human genome. See chapter 13, and the first of those references is genetic entropy. Uh, basically, you can't go up very fast and you're going down all the time. There's no way you can realistically expect evolution to go upward. Since it is not genetically feasible for man to evolve through a Darwinian trial and error process, we believe the most reasonable alternative model is the special creation of man and apes by God, as recorded in the book of Genesis. How can any scientist even consider a supernatural event? The answer is very simple. 
most people accept a natural world and the natural law and simultaneously accept that above and beyond the natural is the supernatural. This applies to most of humanity and applies to most scientists. Before Darwin, the large majority of the founding fathers of science believed in a biblical supernatural beginning. In fact, even after Darwin for some time, we have found that the actual fossil evidence is remarkably supportive of the biblical view of human origins. Genesis chapter one records that man was specially created in the image of God. We read that on the same day Adam was formed, God created an incredible variety of creatures that were to multiply and fill the earth. This easily explains the extravagant diversity of primates. The straightforward reading of Genesis actually provides a coherent framework for interpreting the hominin fossil record. Our, our alternative model predicts that hominin fossils should fall in two groups, apes and humans. This would be because God created man separately from the apes, rather than apes evolving gradually into humans, and so we should not expect to find any credible transitional hominin types. There is no need for a bridge species between Australopithecus and Homo. Moreover, we should not be surprised to find a diversity of apes in the fossil record, many of which would now have gone extinct. We would also expect to find that the extinct Australopithecine apes coexist with, with man prior to their extinction. There's an extensive overlap in time of Australopithecus and Homo. This is true even when we accept the conventional ages for these fossils. See figure five, chapter 11, that we've seen before. Ne nevertheless, in chapter 12, we cite numerous studies that show that the various hominin dating methods are questionable and in the case of carbon-14 actually argue the reverse. The possibility that hominin dates are greatly inflated helps support our model, although the question of dates is a secondary issue. Hopefully, I will be returning to that set of questions uh, next week. It'll be interesting to see what we get. Our alternative framework for understanding ape diversity. The paleo community currently attributes the luxuriant diversity of the hominin species to, quote, evolutionary experimentation, end quote, referring to many evolutionary failed experiments. Um, there's a mutation I missed. That means that a wide array of, array of hominin species evolved, petered out, and eventually went extinct, shown as broken twigs and branches on the hominin bush. In our alternative framework, we, expected much, we expect much the same. Each ape type will multiply, diverge into subpopulations, and undergo limited lo local adaption via selection. Some populations will survive, extant species, and some will peter out. Local adaptation could have been accelerated due to pre-existing designed heterozygous alleles, the gene variants. And I would add, maybe due to environmental things as well, if you have more radiation or toxic chemicals in, a, in an area, you might have accelerated degeneration. To illustrate how primate diversity can arise apart from evolution from a common ancestor, envision a series of smaller trees as opposed to Darwin's single tree or bush, figure three, which we will see at the end of this slide. The base of each tree reflects the independent origin of each very broad genetically diverse ape type. We don't know how many branches there were originally, and it'd be fun to find out. Um, each ape type would have branched out into its own diverse set of subpopulations or species. There could be numerous variations of branches within these basic kinds, thus enabling their descendants to survive and adapt to a wide variety of environments. And there's their picture of the various trees together, with humans, with various things that, that came off of it, and then something like an orangutan, which gives you our two orangutans today. Something like a gorilla, which gives us some other ones. Something like a chimp, which gives us some other ones. And finally, something like an australopith. Are there four b branches? I don't know. And genetics might be able to help us decide that. This is merely adaptation or microevolution, not the type of genetic change required for ape to man macroevolution. Macroevolution requires the spontaneous formation of a great deal of new functional genetic information. 
Adaptive speciation is simply the fragmentation of each created kind into diverse variant species through the sorting, reshuffling, and selection of pre-existing genetic information. Mutations can add to this genetic variation, but mutations almost always result in deleterious variations. Selection can call the worst mutations, but the mutation selection process can only create new information too little and too late, as he went over in chapter 13. Uh, they went over. Our alternative framework for understanding human diversity. Similar to apes and other creatures, the first man and woman would have been created with built-in variation. There's no reason to assume that Adam and Eve were made as homozygous clones. Very reasonably, they would have contained in their genomes a great deal of desirable variation and could have easily been created with tens of millions of single nucleotide variants and maybe even some other variants. As the pop human population grew, it would diverge into many small tribes. The smallest and most isolated tribes would quickly become inbred and would undergo accelerated genetic degeneration. Founder effects and assortative mating would quickly produce the superficial features associated with race. This would not require the slow buildup of new mutations. It would occur simply and quickly through genetic recombination, the reshuffling of pre-existing DNA variants plus limited selection. And perhaps the best illustration of that kind of process is the various breeds of dogs, which obviously all came from a wolf less than 5,000 years ago. In some cases, less than 500 years ago. In small populations, genetic drift would further help populations diverge, rapidly producing the various people groups. This is strikingly similar to the instantaneous divergence model proposed by evolutionary geneticists. You see, there's a lot of common ground there. Selection would increase the frequency of traits adapted to specific climates. Our alternative framework for understanding human dispersion. There are two competing evolutionary models for explaining how the human dispersion occurred. The first is sometimes called the multi-regional model, which involves the evolution of Erectus in Eastern Africa, followed by Erectus coming out in, of Africa into Europe and Asia, including very, various islands of Southeast Asia. After this, Erectus continued to evolve in parallel on all three continents. Remember, this is, Erectus goes back, what, two million years uh, by standard dating? Uh, this parallel evolution led to intermediate, the intermediate forms such as Neanderthals and De De Denis events, eventually resulting in the simultaneous emergence of anatomically modern man on all three continents. Think about this. We didn't evolve once. We evolved three, four, five times maybe, the same, the, way. the same way, which is interesting for a theory. The parallel evolution aspect of this model, <laughs> they simply say, is not credible. The second model is typically called the out of Africa model and is much more popular. This model also envisions Erectus coming out of Africa some one to two million years ago and then spreading all over. Uh, much later, roughly 200,000 years ago. Why? Because of genetics. Anatomically modern man, Homo sapiens, evolved in Africa. This involved a near extinction event, a severe decline in population size, or if you like, a genetic bottleneck. Associated, associated with this bottleneck, there arose what geneticists have called mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. These are hypothetical ancestral genotypes that are based on current genetic patterns around the world. What it means is we are all descended from one man and from one woman. And of course, the biblical story immediately pops into mind. And so people who hate the Adam and Eve story will call this person Y chromosome uh, Adam or mitochondrial Eve. Because what else are you going to call it? Then a second out of Africa event occurred. The tiny endangered African population of early Homo sapiens, which included the genetic and Adam and Eve lineages, suddenly recovered from the near extinction event and very rapidly spread throughout the world. Remember, genetics are pushing them this way. 
the anatomically modern humans then exterminated or perhaps assimilated all of the other human populations such as Neanderthal, Erectus, Denisovans, and Hobbit. This story no longer seems credible because the bottleneck is not feasible if early man was already established in Africa, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Wouldn't there be something else going on? And because such a bottleneck would be lethal or at least degenerative. Well, unless you started out with nearly perfect stuff to begin with, and then, uh, then it wouldn't be quite so deleterious. Our alternative framework for understanding the human divergence incorporates, incorporates aspects of both evolutionary models. We embrace the genetic evidence supportive of the out of Africa model and the fossil evidence supportive, supportive of the multi-regional model. We call our model the out of Middle East model. Our model begins with a very small anatomically modern human population in the general region of the Middle East, which includes Northeast Africa. This Human population undergoes rapid population growth and subsequent dispersion of tribes in all directions into Africa, Europe, and Asia, and eventually into the Americas. Figure four, which we'll come to shortly. Fragmentation of the original population leads to many isolated tribes, resulting in both genetic and linguistic founder effects. And I want you to notice something. In this area, which depending on who you hear, is like 10,000 years ago or so, there's a severe genetic bottleneck and then all of a sudden everything diverges. There's not much of an argument. Well, five versus 10,000, you know. And I can show you papers that use arguments of precisely this kind of thing from the Y chromosome. I don't know whether I'll show them next week because it depends on how much time we have. Um, but it, it's just fascinating that, that actually, uh, notice that if you go down to enough of a bottleneck here, you can't tell what was there before because most of it is destroyed when the bottleneck was formed. Unless you have genetics from here, this is all imaginary for both. Phenotypic differences between tribes become exaggerated due to assortative mating. The rapidly diverging tribes are driven apart due to competition for resources as well as growing linguistic, cultural, and phenotypic differences. This would lead to rapid global dispersion and regional differences in certain skull features, as is consistent with what multi-regionalists see in the fossil record. How do outlying populations such as Erectus, Neanderthal, and Hobbit fit into our model? Throughout this book, we have pointed out that small isolated populations are subject to accelerated ge degen genetic degeneration. And we have been quoting evolutionary paleo experts who say the same thing in nature PNAS, Genetics, and other mainstream journals. And recently, we and they have noted that Erectus, Neanderthal, and Hobbit all show evidences of pathologies and in inbreeding. It seems very reasonable to conclude that very early in human history, these anomalous populations split off from anatomically modern human populations, became isolated, and then experienced inbreeding, genetic drift, and eventual mutational meltdown. Although in the case of Neanderthals, managed to mix with humans eventually. With other humans, I should say. Um, the decline of such populations could happen quite rapidly, resulting in bone beds that show various degrees of genetic degeneration. This would explain the variable degrees of pathology, dwarfing, discarded skulls, and reduced brain volumes seen in Erectus, Hobbit, and Naledi. This is also consistent with multi-regionalists who observe distinctive fossil traits retained in modern populations where their archaic forebears once lived. For example, flatter face and prominent cheekbones of erectus crania from China closely re resemble the modern oriental population. So, yeah. Uh, there's some genetic mixing back in. The major difference in our model is that we propose the reverse. 
Rather than Erectus regionally evolving into modern humans, modern humans devolved locally into Erectus, Hobbit, and Naledi. These early inbred colonies were later replaced as larger, more vi viable populations filled the world. The early isolated and inbred colonies would leave behind the earliest bones and would soon disappear. And of interest, you'll notice that the pygmies in Flores do resemble uh, the hobbit somewhat. Our alternative model neatly explains both the genetic evidence used to support the out-of-Africa model and the fossil evidence used to support the multi-regional model. Evolutionary paleo experts have always struggled to reconcile these two competing models. Further explanation of this model, including mitochondrial Eve, Y chromosome Adam, and design genetic diversity will be presented in a separate book. I am looking forward to that book. Man stands alone, unique in all of God's creation. If the biblical text is a reliable account of origins, we should not be surprised to find that there is no other creature on the planet quite like us. Indeed, this is perhaps one of the most obvious facts of life. The evolutionary paleo community openly acknowledges that man is unique. For example, respected paleo expert Jonathan Marks in History and Philosophy of the Life Sciences Journal writes, it is not that difficult to tell a human from an ape after all. The human is the one walking, talking, sweating, praying, building, reading, trading, crying, dancing, writing, cooking, joking, working, decorating, shaving, driving a car, or playing football. Quite literally from the top of our head, where the hair is continually growing, unlike gorillas, to the tips of our toes, the shortest, stoutest of which is not opposable, one can tell the human apart the human part from the ape part quite readily if one knows what to look for. Our eye whites, small canine teeth, evaporative heat loss, short arms and long legs, breasts, knees, and of course our cognitive communication abilities uh, and the productive anatomies of our tongue and throat are all dead giveaways. I'm reading this to you. I am not an ape. In certain respects, it is true that mankind is very similar to the various kinds of ape, gorilla, chimpanzee, and orangutan. For example, um, we have similar anatomy and biochemistry. Even in terms of our fallen behavior, we are often too, quite often, too quite often apish. It is on this basis that evolutionists justify their claim that humans are just another type of ape, ape essentially just a clever chimpanzee. However, we feel biologically similar between different biological similarities between different kinds of life are better explained by a common designer than by common descent. Either way, organisms that look similar should also be genetically similar, and prior to the sequencing of the respective genomes, neither side could have predicted how similar chimps and humans should be. Thus, any claim that a certain percentage of similarity pr proves common ancestry is logically invalid. See chapter 13. While humans display some d distinct similarities to apes, in the most important aspects we are utterly unique. Only humans can do science, sequence their own genome, reason, engineer cities, visit the moon, write books, pro pro programs, poetry, music, or show agape love. We clearly have dominion over the earth. Only man is a moral being with a soul capable of communion with God. In all these respects, we are incredibly unique. As evolutionist Juan Arsaga writes in the Neanderthal's necklace, we are unique and alone in the world, now in the world. There is no other animal species that truly resembles our own. A physical and mental chasm separates us from all other living creatures. There is no bipedal mammal. No other mammal controls and uses fire, writes books, travels in space, paints portraits, or prays. Now remember, this is an evolutionist, or praise. This is not a question of degrees. It is all or nothing. There is no semi-bipedal animal, none that makes only small fires, writes only short sentences, builds only rudimentary spaceships, draws just a little bit, or prays just occasionally. Uh, although maybe evolutionists are, are slowly degenerating because they pray only occasionally. Likewise, in the words of a famous evolutionist, Jacob, Jacob Bronowski, man is a singular 
creature. He has a set of gifts which make him unique among all the animals, so that unlike them, he is not a figure in the landscape, he is a shaper of the landscape. Evolutionary paleo expert Ian Tattersall, emeritus curator of the American Museum of Natural History, writes, even allowing for the poor record we have of our close extinct kin, Homo sapiens appears as distinctive and unprecedented. There's certainly no evidence to support the notion that we gradually became who we inherently are over an extended period in either the physical or intellectual sense. This is an evolutionist writing. Wow. Indeed, we were created in the image of God and stand alone. The essential biblical difference between apes and man is the spirit that was breathed into mankind on the day of our creation. While the Bible makes no scientific prediction about genetic similarities or differences, it makes profound claims about the spiritual difference between, difference between animals and man. In this light, it is extremely important that we acknowledge that we are not just another primate species. Rather, in a taxonomic sense, mankind should be most accurately placed in a separate kingdom. That is, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, human kingdom. Although, I would have to say that we are closer to animals than we are to plants. Um, evolutionists can even begin to explain how mutation selection might have created consciousness until... Oh, cannot even, I'm sorry. Evolutionists cannot even begin to explain a mutation selection might have created consciousness, intelligence, moral accountability, or the human spirit. This is why so many continually downplay, even to the point of denial, these crucial human traits. It is clear that mankind is transcended among all other living beings and that we are not part of an evolutionary continuum. We are spiritual beings. This is acknowledged by most human beings. However, this is not compatible with a strict, strictly evolutionary view. We've seen people who say, well, consciousness is just um, an epiphenomenon. It's kind of funny because consciousness is the only thing that we have direct experience of. It, our experience of this physical world is modulated through senses. Consciousness is something we actually live through. The genes that enable our unique capabilities, gifts and talents, that is science, art, love, relation to God, could not, have, uh, could not arise by any series of random mutations filtered by natural selection in any amount of time. I don't know if you can say that exactly, but I think that you can say that certainly not in the amounts of time that have been proposed. There is no credible evolutionary mechanism that could lead spontaneously to a mind consciousness intelligence or spirit. Indeed, while these human traits are found within a biological context, that is, within our animal-like body and brain, they clearly s transcend mere biology. I should probably retract what I s uh, my comment on that because uh, if you factor in genetic entropy, it is in any amount of time. We're not going to get there by purely natural forces. We are exquisitely programmed to be more than animals and our bodies are well-designed vessels that house our immaterial being, mind, soul, spirit. This is the biblical perspective of mankind. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are made in the image of God. God breathed his life-giving spirit into us. So what went wrong? The hominin bones are not just contested. Most people find the hominin bones disturbing dead things in dark holes, skulls with bizarre, deformed faces. If God is so good and man is so special, then why does the fossil record look so much like a nightmare? Why does the fossil record speak so clearly of death, disease, mutation, degeneration, and even cannibalism? The final element of our alternative model must address the problem of physical and spiritual corruption. It is widely understood that we are all dying people in a dying world. Left to themselves, even the solar system and the universe will run down. We see evidence of physical and moral degeneration all around us. Our genetic research indicates systematic degeneration. The, Bib the Bible reveals systematic degeneration. We are convinced that the fossil record also indicates systematic degeneration. One of the most fundamental questions that we can ask in life is, why is there so much suffering and evil? No one seems to have a satisfactory answer. That is to say, no one has an answer 
apart from the Bible. Biblically, God made all things good, but men and angels rebelled against God, leading to the corruption of the whole world. I would probably say angels and men, but whatever. Uh, the biblical fall, Genesis 3, is there any better answer? If everything in the world has been corrupted, including our bodies and our souls, what hope do we have? Biblically speaking, we have no hope at all, apart from Jesus and what he did for us. Our hope is not in this body and not in this world. For the time being, our hope is the new life that comes from Christ. Our future hope is eternal life with Christ in a new heaven and a new earth. This is the bright hope that all Christians share. It is a hope available to all who sincerely desire it. Contrary to this biblical view, atheists and many theistic evolutions, it's going to take aim at theistic evolutions in this, in this uh, section, insist that our hope must be earthly. For many, the only hope is ongoing human evolution. They would say that in the past, God, now notice that obviously the atheists don't say this. This is the theistic evolutionists that say this. In the past, God has used random mutations combined with the systematic death of the unfit to transform an ape population into modern man. And of course, they would go further than that and say to uh, transmit uh, bacteria or archaea or something like that into uh, apes to begin with. So in the future, evolution will continue. They believe that in this way, mankind will get better and better. Their hope is that we might naturally evolve into some type of utopian earthly paradise. By the way, you may be interested to know that there are people who propose that squids and octopi are from another planet in another, around another sun because they are so strange. You are seeing the breakdown of the idea that Darwinian evolution explains everything. Some people grad, uh, gladly embrace the very disturbing hominin bones as evidence supporting that, that belief system. They gladly embrace the Australopiths as their kin. They gladly embrace Darwin and the Darwinian paradigm and say this represents both true science and true spirituality. Again, you're looking at theistic evolutionists. We have friends and loved ones who hold this popular view, but we must earn, earnestly disagree. We humbly but firmly contend that this aspect of their science is not solid and that personalized spirituality apart from God's revelation, the Bible, is not a trustworthy hope. This leads to us to some final thoughts of a more personal nature. Now, this uh, part is, is put out like it was a new, parag a new chapter. But I just looked at it again to be sure and no. There's no chapter heading on this. So I'm assuming that this belongs to the chapter. It certainly follows from what has come before. Conclusions are personal perspective. Except for the last chapter of this book, we have focused on the scientific aspects of the hominin fossils. We have only briefly touched on a few philosophical issues. For example, we've emphasized the difference between taxonomic splitters versus lumpers, pointing it out that the difference is largely philosophical. We are unashamedly lumpers. We have pointed out that because paleoanthropology is a historical science as opposed to operational science, interpretation of bones and artifacts is quite subjective and is strongly influenced by philosophical presuppositions. Such presuppositions derive from prior intellectual commitments based on the ruling paradigm, the groupthink, and a scientist's personal worldview. We have seen that while the paleo community is divided on many issues, there remains an unconditional commitment to the basic Darwinian paradigm, and there is unwavering fidelity to the basic ape to man narrative. Can't find it, but it must be there. The classifications of the bones keep changing. The dates keep changing, but the basic paradigm is never subject to critical re-examination. We've gone to great lengths to show that this widely shared commitment to the paradigm is not based on the actual evidence. The paradigm consistently comes first. The evidence is consistently interpreted in light of the paradigm. This strong tendency for the paradigm to overshadow actual evidence is not unique to the paleo community. It applies to us all. Our worldview cover, colors what we, how we see everything 
in light of our own limited ability to know for certain what happened in the distant past, shouldn't there be room for all of us to be more humble? Shouldn't every paradigm be honestly questioned? Shouldn't there be room for respecting dialogue, respectful dialogue? Throughout this book, we've made it very clear that we are skeptics of the ape to man story, which makes us academic dissidents. We do not dissent because we like to be difficult or argumentative. We dissent because we have a different point of view. Our worldview, our prior commitment, is that there is a creator God and that mankind was made by God and in the image of God. This view is shared by a very large part of humanity. This includes a large number of Orthodox Christians, Orthodox Muslims, and Orthodox Jews. Many are in the academic community and many would openly dissent, if they dared. Personally, we are both Orthodox, that is traditional, Bible-believing Christians. The traditional Christian paradigm embraces nature, natural law, and natural science. In addition to the natural world, Christians embrace the supernatural realm, the reality of the soul, the reality of good and evil, the reality of spiritual struggle, the reality of miracles, and the reality of life after death. The Christian paradigm centers on an infinitely good and loving God and includes a literal Adam and Eve, a literal fall, and the historical corruption of mankind. The Christian paradigm specifically affirms that we've all fallen short of God's holy standard. We've all sinned. And this is what separates us from God. The sacrificial death of Jesus made a way for us to be washed clean of sin, and the resurrection of Jesus made a way for us to be redeemed and reconciled with him and all who receive him for all eternity. For those who choose to accept it, this is incredibly good news. Hundreds of millions of people have joyfully embraced this good news. Yet there are many people who are offended by such things. We do not wish to offend anyone, but we wish to share the good news with everyone. We did not invent, pardon me, we did not invest years of effort on this book just so that we could win the argument. We did it because we love people and countless people are turning away from the good news because they have been persuaded that ape to man evolution makes traditional faith impossible. More specifically, hundreds of millions have been persuaded that ape to man evolution disproves one, A, a, a loving creator God, B, the supernatural creation of man, C, a supernatural fall, D, the reality of sin, E, the need for a savior, and F, the hope of heaven. We urge all people to trust in God more and trust in man less. God wants us to believe him, with or without physical evidence, yet in his mercy, God is giving us various evidences that can help us to trust him more. We hope that this book will encourage many people to trust God more. In closing, we ask our readers to seriously consider seven personal questions. One, if you could choose, would you prefer to be an extremely clever ape or beloved child of God? Two, if you could choose, would you prefer someday to be reduced to rotting bones or someday become an eternal citizen of heaven? Three, if you could choose, would you prefer the praise of men or the praise of God? Four, if heaven has a cost, what cost do you think might be too high? Would you go so far as to consider taking the risk of being called a fool? Five, can you imagine saying no to human evolution? How much evidence would you need? Six, can you imagine saying yes to Jesus? How much evidence would you need? Seven, if you wanted to believe Jesus, but you struggled with unbelief, what evidence might God give you to help you trust in him? If God in his mercy gave you evidence like that, might you then become a true believer and give your life to Jesus? Well, you didn't think of it this way, but this is an evangelistic book. And then at the end, it has resources for digging deeper and then uh, a couple of other things that uh, uh, are nice to have, but uh, don't advance the argument directly. Now, my take on all this, I think that Rupert and Sanford have done a great service to not only the creationist community, but to science as a whole. They have collected and correlated a huge amount of data and shown that it does not support this traditional idea that apes evolved to man in a straightforward manner. 
This means that the traditional idea is what one could call zombie science. Dead, but still taught as if it were alive. <laughs> one potential criticism of their work is that it is biased. That criticism is partly blunted by the fact that Sanders used to be an evolutionist and was driven to his position in large part, Sanford, I'm sorry, that was my mistake, and was driven to his position in large part by the findings of science. The other defense, and an even better one, is that if you do not believe they've been fair, you can look it up for yourself. The footnotes allow you to trace, retrace their evidence and see whether it backs up their claims. I find it powerful evidence that the newer discoveries seem to fit into their theory without having to need much modification in either. Whereas, as the, we keep hearing, we need to rethink evolution, evolutionary theory, quite often. The most obvious example is the footprints from Crete, which are clearly human. 5.7 million years old by traditional dating. How do you account for that? They're, they account for it quite straightforwardly. But, you know, there's other ones. DNA from Neanderthals is another example. There's more evidence that I hope to be able to present this coming week. The book is obviously incomplete, as all books are. The authors acknowledge this when they talk about the genetic evidence and promise a new book, to which I am looking forward to with great anticipation. The book is incomplete on the time question, particularly the, uh, the question of radiometric dating. I hope that sometime we will see another book dealing with that question right now. The best book I've seen on this subject is Radioisotopes on, and the Age of the Earth. Um, two, there's a one as well. Um, but it's certainly, it's not complete either. But then science is often not complete, so that doesn't bother me too much. Uh, but this book is still the best current summary of the evidence on the supposed ape-to-man transition, I think replacing Marvin Lubinow's classic Bones of Contention. I highly recommend this book. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, come in over here. Jack. This is a, a wonderful assemblage of evidence that treats science as science. They do leave to me some very important open questions and it seems like they keep stepping away from... Uh, this seems to support most directly what I've often heard alleged as being the Catholic position where God stepped in and created humans, but let evolution do everything else. And I don't see them contraindicating that as a major purpose. Well, that's definitely not their position. Well, they seem to avoid dealing with evolution of the wider uh, <coughs> variety of, of plants and animals. Well, there are a couple of things. One of them is they, they, they're dealing with a fairly narrow question. Right. And they, they are writing to capture people for whom if you started out by saying, you know, everything's short age, uh, uh, they would turn uh, the evidence off immediately because all oh, those are just creations, you know them. Um, and so they start at the first 10 chapters, the first 11 chapters really, they don't challenge the time scale at all. In the 12th chapter, they make specific comments about the time scale that give you a very good clue as to where they're coming from. And in fact, one of the things that they kind of lean a little bit on they don't put as much stock in it as they could, uh, or as they uh, emphasis on it as they could. Um, and that's why I mentioned that, that they're incomplete, but they definitely use radiometric dating to argue for a short time frame for life on Earth. 
Um, I would go on to say that they don't make a big deal of it, but the reason why Sanford went from a, uh, a believer in evolution proper to a creationist is not entirely because he said, well, if you throw the whole thing out, why don't we just start with the Bible? Uh, it is partly that with, uh, with evolutionary degeneration happening instead of evolutionary advancement as the major force, that species can't last more than a few hundred thousand years at, a, at the optimum, if that. And so I think that his, that he was actually driven to, I mean, species lasting for a million years, well, something must be wrong with those, da the, you know, 10 million, 100 million, horseshoe crabs are still around? Come on, guys. That's 500 million years. If you shrink that to a few hundred, you know, 100,000 years, suddenly you're into a creationist type of uh, Well, uh, model. To, to me, the strongest contraindication of what I just suggested is the fact they make it very clear that they see human origin as happening during creation week. Yeah. That's very clear. That is very clear. But if you were to... Uh, I think what he's trying to do is not lead with his chin, because Sanford is not, and uh, Chris Roop is just beginning to be, you know, something. Uh, Sanford is not a uh, a radiometric dater by train, and so while he'll kind of mention it as you know this kind of hints, he won't beat on that drum because. He doesn't know the tune very well. And for that, I don't blame him. But, I, but he is very definitely a short-age creationist. He would go for the whole thing. And if you stick around next week, I'll give you some new evidence that backs him up sure. for the works. Sure. I, I think all in all, the impact, I would agree with your assessment of the impact of the book. That's all I have to say. Okay, now we have a comment here. Go ahead, Wes. I think some of us recall that Sanford was here and lectured to us uh, maybe about 10 years ago or eight or nine, and uh, how much we enjoyed it. That was very inspirational. Uh, we still not, have that recorded, by the way. <laughs> don't ever not have it, because it's uh, worthwhile. Um, it has been mentioned, uh, theistic evolution has been mentioned, which uh, turns out to be a favorite of all, some of our, some of us on this very campus. Yes, yes. But uh, I think it needs to be, something else needs to be mentioned that uh, is, to my mind, uh, uh, more predominating and more more uh, overwhelming, and that is the great controversy. Uh, I did not catch in what you reviewed, although I can miss these things, admittedly, that he had any explanation for why there has been the deterioration in what was originally uh, perfect. God saw that it was good. And the explanation is the introduction of sin and Satan. And I, I, as I understand it, and I, some of us keep repeating it repeatedly, and it can't be repeated too often, that uh, one of the main advantages that Adventists have is the understanding of the great controversy and how Satan is involved in it as a person as real as God. Uh, it is very encouraging that Sanford and his co-writer uh, have such a burden to, to acknowledge the existence of God 
But uh, by the same token, where is their acknowledgement of the existence of Satan, who in the in the play out of our of evolution is almost, I might say, as crucial as God himself is. Um, how many of you caught glimpses of a great controversy type theme in that in this last chapter that we were going through? I I thought that there was some. I, maybe it isn't as well developed as, as we as Adventists sometimes put it, but he did talk about degeneration being the fault of the, of the devil who caused the fall. I was looking for it uh, very avidly, and I'm glad you caught it, even if I missed it. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. I think maybe it wasn't his main thrust in that, this particular writing. I, I don't know. I, I think that's right, that he hit it kind of glancingly, but he, but he did hit it, mm -hmm. uh, that, that there was a fall and that that was due to not just evil in general, but a devil in particular. Can you define for me theistic, theistic evolution? Uh, you know. Okay. Just I'll try. Brian Bull can. What, uh, one, uh, there's, there, there are two things. One of them is that I'm going to tell you that theistic evolution is not a single entity. There are actually two entities. At least. At least. But, but there are two, if philosophically, there are two major groups of entities. Uh, and, and if other people can fill it out. The original idea of theistic evolution is that evolution happened in a traditional semi-Darwinian way, although you have to realize that that's, I would say, uh, a Darwinian way even becomes a little ambiguous because Darwin, when he started out, had no knowledge of genetics. And so, because nobody else did. So, start with, Darwin. start with Darwin. Start with Darwin. In those days, there was no, and that was the idea that God kind of supervised the process. Maybe nudged it a little bit here, maybe nudged it a little bit there, um, but that the history is still one of, of everything happening naturally most of the time but with God guiding the processes ever upwards. We didn't start. We'd, we'd, well, in that kind of theistic evolution, there is intelligent intervention, and it may or not be able to be detected. And that kind of theistic evolution is actually compatible with intelligent design because all intelligent design says you can tell there was a designer. It doesn't say how fast he worked, how he worked, whether it's he or she or many, or you know, whether it's some kind of intelligent life force out there that, that's hard to pull together. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that if you, if you just leave things alone, it won't happen that somebody had to do some kind of intervention. Okay, and that's compatible with slow evolutionary change, if necessary. It's also compatible with rapid evolutionary change. It is, uh, basically, it's a kind of an unfalsifiable position, except that if you could explain everything without, uh, without recourse to uh, any kind of supernatural entities, then you would probably effectively falsify it. But the newer version of, of, of theistic evolution, and this is the one that has captured the field, so to speak, is one which says that if there are any interventions directly, 
you can't tell where they happened. You can't even tell statistically where they happened. That we believe by faith that God was involved, but God's invo uh, involvement if there was any involvement at all, is so far back that he basically created the universe and let it spread out the way it was going to. And that he designed a process that could eventually result in humans. Uh, but the process operates on its own. It's automatic. God, as some people would say, sunk all the billiard balls with one break. And it's just a matter of watching them bounce back and forth and everything falls into a pocket. So there's not a seven day creation? There is not a seven day creation. Actually, there's not a seven day creation in any of those. Both forms of theistic evolution do not have a seven day creation. Um, both forms also, by the way, do not have a universal or near universal flood. Now, uh, you go, why, why say near universal? Because I'm not sure that the flood story would be falsified by a raft of, of uh, uh, koalas and, and kangaroos uh, sitting on vegetation that landed in Australia while everything else came out of the ark. Because how would the people who are in the ark know that there was one or two refugia that managed to somehow allow land animals out? Uh, and that is a kind of reasonable, it, it, it depends on how you interpret scripture. Was scripture written by people who wrote what they saw or was it written by God who was making pronouncements about the the universality of the of the situation um, and you know your model of exactly how inspiration works will influence whether you would entertain that kind of a model but that model would still have the vast majority of the hum uh, of the animal and human landscape and and earth landscape be massively remodeled in a flood and would still probably have the Cambrian uh, be the base of a massive worldwide flood that was only a few thousand years ago. Is it 4.3? Is it 4.5? Is it 5.7? 7.5? Depends on what you do with numbers. And, you know, if it were 12,000, it would still it would still be much less than what we were, than what we normally think of as you know geologic deep time it's not even close if it were 100,000 it would still be way less there is basically a no man's land between 100,000 and uh probably uh 100 million at least and of course, with radiometric dating, they've kind of zeroed that into uh, 540 million years, more or less. And I can show you a chart where it's moved back and forth. Uh, written by evolutionists, by the way. Not, I mean, this is not really debatable. Um, and, uh, and 3 billion, more or less, for the origin of life. Maybe 2, maybe 2.5, maybe 3.8. But it's in that range. And the Earth being 4.6 whatever billion years old. So there is, the, there is that range, and then there's the complete resurfacing of the Earth a few thousand years ago. And basically, there isn't a lot of compromise between those two. Uh, yes, and then we have a comment here. Uh, just comment that uh, your second model uh, is very close to uh, deism. 
Yes. And uh, a lot of people uh, uh, believe in deism, and uh, yes. it's it's uh, it's a very popular idea that. Uh, uh, and some uh, of our founding fathers were deists, by the oh way. Oh yes, very much so. Uh, and in fact, um, yeah. Theistic evolution, as the newer definition, actually is effectively deism. They hate that, and they try to call us the deists and, and them the believers in a god. But the fact of the matter is that that is, I think, fairly, arguably, projection. Yes? Um, I was just looking up on my cell phone. <laughs> It says, uh, Francis Collins describes theistic evolution as the position that, quote, evolution is real, but that it was set in motion by God, end quote, okay. and characterizes it as accepting, quote, that evolution occurred as biologists describe it, but under the direction of God. That's basically what yeah, I've understood that's, that's as a pretty good theistic description. evolution. Yeah. And basically, once, once God had life, he took his hands off but and he, let it go wherever it wanted to. Yeah. But same, God created, put it out there, and then he doesn't touch it after that. And, and That's see, my it's, understanding of It's very of convenient to do that because from a thoroughgoing naturalistic evolution, you have to have life be kind of automatically generated too. Um, which is a real stretch. And the people who study that actually pretty frankly say we have no idea what's going on. And in fact, one of them proposed that this is an argument for multiple universes because the odds are just too great against the origin of life starting. And he was doing an absolutely maximized probability. That is, he was starting with, you only need 100 pieces of RNA to create a self-replicating loop. Then once the self-replicating loop gets started, it gets mutations that make it better, and make it better, and make it better, and make it better. And then he says, and then there's another jump because that's RNA, which is designed to propagate RNA, and now you have to get transfer RNAs, you have to get an RNA that's functioning as DNA, and that, that now creates its own stuff, and that's another jump, because the RNA that's evolving is evolving under pressure to, to make more RNA, not to make protein. And so now you have, he, his, his optimized, and again, hyper-optimized, I mean, these are ridiculously high assumptions for the probabilities. Um, and he says that in his article, is the probability of 10 to the 1,018th. Now, to get you some idea of how big that number is, there are approximately 80 particles in the entire universe, 10 to the 80th particles in the entire universe. Which means that if you were to have each one of them flipping a coin, <laughs> each particle in the entire universe flipping a coin, for um, for 100 times the age of the universe, you could only flip the coin 10 to the about 150 times. And it's not like it's, well, you just had two universes. You have to have 10 to the 1018 minus 120, whatever that is, universes which is like 10 to the 1,000, or 10 to the 900 and some odd <coughs> universes. Just more universes than there are particles in this one. Way more. 
and and the the odds just just blow you away and so people who think about this realize that it's not a bad idea to have God start life at least but after that evolution can take off and and do what it's going to do and what happened with Sanford is he realized that you know what it's not going to work because of two things one of them is it's incredibly slow to get a good mutation and the second one is while you're getting that good mutation you're having a million plus mutations that are going the other direction and you keep doing that you're going to destroy your your material in the first place uh, yes and then here go ahead yeah. I would just add uh, to just what you said there that, uh, at least to me, the, uh, one of the strongest arguments against theistic evolution is geology. Uh, you get out there and look at those layers, they're so incredibly different than anything going on at present, and fit what you'd expect from the flood. Rates of erosion are incredibly fast compared uh, for, for the layers to last there. And, and the gaps between these layers, where there's supposed to be gaps, are incredibly flat. And what's worse is that in some places you know that they were soft, soft. the whole time. Exactly. So, uh, uh, to me, that, that, uh, that's hard to explain that, except in the context of the flood. Yeah. Which, you know, uh, kind of wrecks the time scale. Yeah. And I would say that the, the existence of carbon-14, the existence of, you know, Protein. apparent blood cells in, yeah. in, in what apparently are, are blood vessels in, in dinosaur bones. Come on, guys. If you, if you didn't know, you would assume these were very recent. And that's, of course, why it took so long to discover them is because everybody knew that they couldn't possibly be leftover material but they are go ahead what are theistic evolutionists especially Adventist ones um, I've heard stories recently and I'm very disheartened by by what I hear what are they running from as Seventh-day Adventist are they they think they're running to science they think they're running to science. And that uh, the Bible as uh, they have the first 11 chapters is just phony history. That's right. They have been told for so long that if you're going to be a good scientist, there's something that all good scientists accept. And one of them is that we're all related. And one of them is that there's been a lot of time. And and this is hammered and hammered and hammered again. And one of the things that is used to hammer it is this ape to man sequence, which of course is based on, and the person who drew it said it was based on, very flimsy evidence. We don't have a good you know, as you look at it closer, Homo habilis disappears. Homo sediba disappeared. You have apes and you have humans. Now, could there be some genetic crossover of some kind? Yeah. But it doesn't look like it's very impressive. Uh, the, the, the lines are actually pretty good. Yes, you uh, just a minute. Jan, uh, Jan had We'd some like comments. We want to share with people behind us. In case. <laughs> um, it, do you see this as a potential? Um, trying to, I'm trying to come to the right word. How will Adventism handle this as far as the church as a whole? Will, will, this always, will this just always be until Jesus comes that 
we, we don't know everything. We're not supposed to know everything. That's God's place. Um, um, I think that there, if you want me to put on my prophet's robe, um, what I think will happen is that it will eventually split the church. I think that what will happen also is pretty clearly that the church's uh, hierarchy will disappear either because it is declared illegal or because uh, some branch of it decides to take the church in a different direction. Uh, I would like to think the former. But given our performance in China when the Chinese Communists took over, I'm a little worried. But in any case, I think that's up to God anyway. And the thing that I want you to kind of go home with is the idea that we are not members of a church. We are believers in a movement. That's very good. And for those of us who realize that, church, membership on church books doesn't mean a thing mm -hmm. in the long run. That's very good. And furthermore, I anticipate that a lot of creationists will join us. I'm not sure exactly how firmly. Um, but they will be attracted to the movement. You know, the sermon this morning was on Pentecost. There's something sobering for people who want control of church structure. How many people were in the original church when Pentecost hit? 120, right? Okay. What happened at the first evangelistic meeting? 3,000 3, and then a week later maybe another 2,000. Now I want you to think about this. You know what that means? That means that the church hierarchy could easily have been outvoted. Mm. <laughs> Why did Peter remain a pillar of the church? It wasn't because he had political power. It was because he had a message and everybody knew it and respected it. It wasn't Peter, it was that Peter had been with Jesus. And whatever, whatever authority we will have in church later on will be precisely that kind of thing. We will have no authority of our own. Whatever authority we have will be because people recognize that we had been with Jesus. We're not going to be able to control this by traditional control methods. Masters in Business Administration is going to be totally useless. In fact, a doctorate in law is going to be totally useless. Because what happens is going to be a movement, not a church. And ecclesiastical law is going to be worthless. And policies and regulations. And policies and regulations are going to be worthless, except insofar as they make sense to people. Because the fact of the matter is that if we have anywhere near the kind of evangelistic success that is anticipated, we're going to be outvoted. And it's only the strength of the ideas that's going to hold us. We need to think about that as we are trying desperately to keep the church pure. You know what, that maybe not uh, isn't our job. Yeah. Our job is to keep the message pure. Mm -hmm. And purification can't be done by getting rid of all of 
you're going to have people who have kind of crazy ideas that hopefully become less crazy as they encounter the truth. And we can't maintain walls and say, oh, you can't come, because what happens if they want to step over it? Right. Um, if I can put it in another way, people always worry about the, sl the slippery slope. And there is such a thing as a slippery slope. You go from this idea to this idea to this idea to this idea. And, and if you step back in the long perspective, you can see that people are going the wrong way. But the problem with the slippery slope is not the slope. It is gravity. <laughs> yeah. You've said that before. Because if you can reverse gravity, if you can have a center to which things are attracted, then people slide up the slippery slope. And it becomes an advantage. We make a mistake by trying desperately to keep people from slipping down, when what we need to do is turn on the magnet so that people get sliding back up. And the magnet is going to be Jesus to start with and the truth, the whole truth that we can get around Jesus to help out. And Jesus says that he is intimately connected with the truth. He says, I am the truth. That doesn't mean that Jesus is a good guide to automobile repair. But what it does mean is that you get hold of truth anywhere and you follow it and you don't deviate from it, eventually you'll be led to Jesus. If you get hold of scientific truth, if you get hold of philosophical truth, if you get hold of any kind of truth, truth, beauty, will eventually, if you don't cut it off, will eventually get you to Jesus. There is the Jesus only movement. Yeah. Anyway, so. now I'll take off my prophet hat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that though, because I like bringing things back into the spiritual realm. Yeah. We have to. We have to realize that our only our only hope Speech. is to get hold of the truth and get hold of Jesus. And see what this book has done is it has brought out a facet of the truth. And if you follow it far enough, it will lead you to Jesus. They took, you know, they took in the end and say, and look at where you're going and you're scared of going there, but you know, you need to go there if you're gonna follow the truth. The guest that we just had. Uh huh. I, I remember him saying, it's not, it's, not, it's not what they say, it's what they leave out. So the Jesus only movement is, from, from my understanding, somewhat of a deviation of. Well, the one thing that you don't want to do is avoid subjects because they're controversial. Because if you do that, then you truncate Jesus. Remember, the same Jesus that we worship said that creation trumps the Mosaic law when it comes to marriage. Law says you can divorce. You got to do it fairly. Jesus says, well, you're really not supposed to be divorcing at all. That's because in the beginning he made them male and female, and then he's, he said, and again he's quoting Genesis 1, and he's quoting Genesis 2, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. And then he finishes off with the conclusion, therefore what man, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And almost every time you get to a Christian wedding, you will hear that quoted. Mm -hmm. 
It's Jesus. That's not just the Old Testament. And see, if you accept Jesus as your Savior, as your guide, as your truth, then you are led inextricably back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. He accepted it. Why shouldn't you? Yes. Well, because of the science. Well, maybe yes, the science but, is overrated. But, but uh, you know, the message to the Laodicean church reminds us of creation at the very introduction. It doesn't say, oh, you, you remember creation? Well, it's not that way anymore. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> yeah. If you want to know how authoritative creation was for Jesus, that's how authoritative it was. And so, yeah, I'm with the Jesus movement. But I want to hear what Jesus had to say about all kinds of things. And you know, he was pretty traditional in that regard. Anyway, come back next week and we're going to find out about genetics points to the flood.